That was your 30 seconds. Right, so. That's me this time, and I can't cope with random orders, so I'm just going to go a straight forward sweep around the room so I can cope. So, guys at the back, have you chosen which one you're going to talk about? Did you? Right, okay. <laughs> Okay, so you went for passion. I, well, I, I'm looking at the thing now and I'm thinking, I, I'm totally misunderstood what we did in the first place. But I think we, the only thing we did is to say, we had loads of different ideas, but we sort of feel like the one thing that we do know is that levels aren't anywhere in there. So that, I don't oh, know if right, that's helpful okay. or not. But, but everything we did say that we wanted them to progress in, we, we said we wanted them. Yeah. It's just like we felt that they were also interlinked. Yeah. We didn't actually pick one that was the most important thing. To be musical. Right, okay. <laughs> yes, no, we didn't want to do that homework, so we did a totally different one. <laughs> yeah, how many times have you heard that? Right, let's take one. Although, oh, go on. Like, uh, one of the conversations I was listening into was, was talking about somebody else's idea of progress. And you were yeah. talking about language, weren't you? And, um, you know, it, somebody thought it was a, came in and uh, thought it was a great lesson in making progress because the literacy was embedded. You know, and maybe that's not the kind of progress which we're talking about, but that's somebody else's value of progress, which is quite an interesting conundrum. You know, if you're not being watched by somebody who bought into this musical world, you've got that going on too. Mm. Okay, this table, your your top one. Critical awareness of dot 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 dot, which relates to independence. Okay. Yeah, we we felt very okay. much I think that. <laughs> Um, we talked a lot about skill, depth and breadth of understanding and, you know, would our students leave knowing about different instruments or being better at their instrument, but we also sort of felt that a critical awareness of what they were doing kind of fed through all of those. So could they, as they got further through, were they aware of how their skill was progressing and were they aware of what they understood and how that sort of helped them to develop all the rest of it? so that they didn't just know more skills and have no framework for it, or they didn't just know some new stuff, but they were actually aware of what they were improving and where they were going with things. Mm. I was thinking we get a really interesting debate on this table about knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, what kind of knowledge? <laughs> you know, you know, was it knowledge about and all, all of those kinds of things, you know, and how did the knowledge fit in? So I can see where that's come from. It wasn't raised by me. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is interesting anyway because in the wider education sphere as you'll know there's currently a, a discussion about knowledge and skills and so we, we've obviously got to fit into the wider education sphere so that's interesting okay um, we basically said <coughs> skills in general so both um, musical as well as whole child so the cooperation of all those sorts of skills that are going to be developed so we just choose the win skills <laughs> right, okay. So, but I mean, as a lurker, I found it interesting lurking, listening to your conversations, because I, I think these are important discussions to have with like-minded colleagues. And I think one of the dangers of being a music teacher is it's quite difficult to have this conversation if you're in a department of 1.275 or whatever it is that the average is this year. That, you know, talking to the 0.275 about this sort of stuff is actually quite difficult. Whereas actually being a, it, it's it's to do with the way the way that we do this. We're moving on to um, the next part, which is about looking at your own practice. And we've talked quite a lot about the summative stuff. Um, but before you go leaping into your own units of work, we kind of wanted to just, I suppose, highlight um, some of the formative things that we might come on to later and how they might be used. And so these are really just questions for you to think about when we go on to the, I'll go on to the next slide and I'll come back to this one. Basically, we've asked you to bring in a unit of work, a scheme of work, whatever you're gonna call it, that you want to share, and look at how progression is evidenced in that, and what kinds of assessment that is you're using, how attainment is assessed, how progression is assessed during, and as part of that, and then we're gonna get you to feedback. But as part of that, we just feed some other things into you to think about how do you use some of the formative stuff to get to the knowledge of the kids that you're, and the, the picture of them that you're trying to kind of develop. 
what kind of strategies do you use to generate talk, discussion and questions, to check understanding and awareness, to highlight misconceptions, to find out what people think? So what's going on within your units and within your work that actually has got your radar up and is helping you to find out <coughs> to get them to reflect, to, to do the things that you were talking about, the, the things that you're trying to track um, or you're trying to show progression on as you go through. So we're going to move to this activity with your own units of work. We have quite a big table here, we'll ask some people to move over to here in a second, but the idea is that um, you probably just work in pairs or threes and think about the units that you've brought with you, sharing that that you've, you've got with other people, but actually, what is the progression that goes through that unit? What is it that you think you're trying to get? What's thinking about the learning that you're trying to get from it and how are you evidencing that progression through it? So we're gonna give you a little bit of time on this. Can I just do a check before we do? Sure. Because before we ask you to discuss the homework, can we just oh, yeah. check that everybody's, everybody's done the homework. homework and that you have a range of schemes of work between you? So rather than ask you if you haven't, could I ask you if you've brought a scheme of work with you, can you show in the standard sort of key stage three way? Right. So maybe the, the people who've got their hands up, go and find somebody who hasn't got their hand up and then work together with them. Gives you something. <laughs> Okay. And the people without their hands up, you're obviously in detention yeah. and you'll be sleeping yeah. up around so the back of the bike. We definitely need some of you guys over there to work with people here yeah. and also to use the space here. Yeah. then you give the instruments out and then you think I better just check that they know what they're going to do so you've all got the instruments out you've all got your things can I just talk you through um, what we're going to be asking you to do so think about specifically what aspects of musical learning and a list would be nice are being evidenced in terms of progression in the schemes of work whatever you call them in the schemes of work that you've brought with them and then there's some subsidiary questions there now obviously as I think you'll work out. What the point of this exercise is doing the exercise, so this is understanding evidence and achievement. So there's an awful lot of relevant discussions that we want you to be having with each other. But if you could be bearing in mind that's what the task is. Now obviously you're all highly creative people and divergent thinking is thoroughly to be expected and recommended, not a problem. But do try and keep in the back of your mind that there is a bit of a purpose to this. Um, so don't feel that you've got to adhere, but on the other hand, do be careful with your divergent thinking so that if you've asked the kids to compose a song and they come back and they've made a table in woodwork, that it's not that sort of thing that you're doing. Okay? So, a few minutes and we will interrupt at appropriate moments. We are... We're asking you to press the pause button on your thinking on that because we're going to revisit it in a few minutes. So, the pause button has been well and truly pressed we're going to move on to some other things, then we're going to come back and you can unpress your pause buttons at that point. But we just want to do a little bit of moving on and, and doing some more thinking. Um, so one of the questions, and again, this is now semi-rhetorical because you may have considered this already, but one of the questions that we, we'd like to propose to you is what about progression in quality of music made? Now, you may or may not have talked about progression in quality, but one of the things that's quite interesting is to think about what does this actually mean? Because there are some real issues with what does quality mean when we start to think about key stage three music. Now, that's particularly the point, because that's, after all, what we're here for. So what does quality mean? How is it defined? And sometimes I wonder, when I ask these sorts of questions, if you could actually miss the word how out. So is it defined? 
So is quality defined? Do we know what it is? And a really, really vital question for Key Stage 3 is whose music? Now this is the title of a book back in 1977, when it was first published, Whose Music? And it was then talking about whose music figures in the school curriculum. And I think that's still an issue today. Whose music? One of the things that is, is quite enlightening to consider is, is the role of music teacher as cultural gatekeeper that figures in some discussions about music education. And we've had a bit of that in terms of some of the rewriting of the national curriculum and in some of the discussions that came in around the use of that word canon. So it's the role of music teacher as cultural gatekeeper. Do you want to put yourself in that role? Are you the cultural gatekeeper to, and the discussions that are, were being had and I think are still being had, is are you the cultural gatekeeper of a Western art music culture? And this is the, <coughs> I've forgotten the dates that the ISM put on there, at the GCSE. Well, they didn't put it, it was put forward. No, but they had a campaign, didn't they, with a yeah. hashtag? 1700 to 1900. Yeah, that sort of thing, which is... But last I heard, we've got an extra 60 years. Oh, there, really? Potentially. Okay. <laughs> Where? Which way? Um, 50 years at the beginning and 10 years at the end. But I don't know. The, that was only hearsay. It's not out yet, so... Okay. So that's <laughs> sort of Bach-ish to Tchaikovsky... Ish. Do we get a bit later than Tchaikovsky? Do we see? Okay, just about, but I guess we, we miss out the right of spring then. So, okay. So, anyway, so, so cultural gatekeeper, is this, should it be the role of the music teacher? So there's a who's music question, and that, that's very, very big in terms of what's going on in schools. So I think that's really quite a useful thing to think about. Which takes us to this, and I said we'd revisit it, and now it's the time to revisit it. I call it meta-proof. Um, knowing progression has occurred, proving progression has occurred, and then proving that you've proved progression has occurred. And I think it generally stops at this point. But I think that there are issues. I think as music educators, we have a view that progression has occurred. Then we are asked to prove that progression has occurred, and then, as in the verbal feedback stamp given that I talked about earlier on, we've got to prove that we've proved that progression has occurred. And so I think that that gives it a, a sort of a three-stage notion of meta-proof in terms of what we do, what we, what we work on, and then what we do with this information. And I think it's at this level that people start writing to us because they've got to prove that they've proved they've done it. And it's here that it gets quite complicated. Now, Ali has this, this notion of this piece of software, which I'm sure my might windows won't way. connect to. Might do. Okay, See. it might do. But in, I think it's important to just think about what do you have to prove that you've done to people? And what do you have to prove that you've proved that you've done? And the head of music I was talking to um, in one of our partnership schools, and said, said something I thought was quite sad. She said, I've had to stop doing junior orchestra, or whatever it was she's had to stop doing, because I have to provide weekly spreadsheets to the SLT, and there just aren't enough hours in the day, and the only way place I could steal something from was after school on a Wednesday or whatever, so I had to stop doing this in order to provide a weekly spreadsheet that we go to and analyse in a meeting. So it wasn't just that she had done progression, or that the kids had progressed. It was that she'd done progression, then she'd proved that she'd done progression, then she had to go somewhere else and prove that she'd proved it. The knock-on effect was that a musical activity stopped being able to take place. I just want to show you this. I don't know if anybody else is using Edmodo. Um, it's a free piece of software that some of the schools in Brighton and Hove have been um, using. One of them gave me the log on, but um, one of the things that Ofsted say that they actually want to see, they tell us plenty about what they don't want to see, but one of the things they say is that they would like to see, I think it says something like a well-ordered catalogue of recordings over time, and you were talking in this group here about the critical engagement and, you know, getting children to think and kind of recognise, and so what this teacher has done is she set up a blog on here for each class, she makes recordings every now and then, or they make recordings themselves and they upload them, 
Um, there's often discussion at the end. I haven't really got time to play them to you. I'm not sure about the sound, but if you played this this through, um, she leaves it running at the end so that they can listen to the discussion that's happened and then hear it back. They can log on to it at home. They can share their work with their parents, which has also been quite um, revelatory in how many parents have now come to see them at parents' evening because they're much more interested in children's music education. Um, but also it, it means that the teacher um, can keep the, the conversations going and the kids can reflect themselves if they want to, they can listen back to stuff. So it's just another way, I suppose. We've, we've spent a little bit of time today talking about frameworks, but this is just a practical way for you to be able to do some of this stuff. And there's <coughs> lots and lots the teacher is picking up in this and the kids without having to go for that horrendous, I'm going to have to have an assessment lesson at the end of every unit. Um, might be sometimes useful, but certainly not always. Um, so that's just something to digress, to show you. Edmodo, definitely worth a look, and it's free. Um, it, it's very quick to use. Um, you can make recordings on iPads, um, upload them straight to a cloud, and then it kind of magically does it itself. It's <coughs> like bringing things into the right places. So. Could you do a similar thing? So school may have a VLE system. Yeah. So where, where I can make a forum or a class. Yeah. So say, for example, I've recorded their performances, I just post them on there, and then each group can comment on their own. Yeah, so they can they can do things like that, or you can might have the whole class thing on there, and it just shows the class's journey over the year, and um, it does it through audio. We're about sound, and you know that's how it needs to be, because I think often in music we forget that the time has gone, that has happened already. You know, if you've got an artifact that done something in art, you you point to it and you go, we see that bit there. You know, it's very difficult in music if we haven't actually captured it in some way, um, and they get the ownership of it as well. So I think it's really good. But there's lots of them around. There's things like My Big Campus. That's another one that schools are using, but Edmodo is just very, very simple um, to, to use. And it's useful because it, it's another tool. So I, th I think the thing is finding the tool that's right for you to <coughs> use in your school. Um, the little type at the bottom says personal communication from a teacher. Uh, and the teacher wrote to me and said, also won't be bothered about all of that when they visit us. They want to see consistency across the school. In other words, they, you know, they're not, according to this teacher, they, they in Ofsted want to to be that. So I was quite bothered by this, so I spoke to Robin Hamilton, the Ofsted inspector, and said, what, what do you think about this, this idea of consistency? Because obviously I can say things, but I'm not a, an Ofsted inspector, but he said neither of us are. Um, and it's, it, what, what are schools' views on it? And, and Ofsted's view was, was quite specific, that, that that's not the case. And he said, does consistency mean doing things identically? And as the Ofsted music inspector, he said that when I go into schools and they say we want to do things identically, his answer is, well, you want the music teacher to give you a national curriculum sub-level every half term, that's about five weeks, do you ask your maths teachers to give you a national sub curriculum sub-level every week? Because that's five lessons, it's about the same time for them. Because that would be being consistent. And so there's, it's, it's making this thinking apparent, because there's consistency... And then there's the notion, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute, of coherence. Now, one of the things that um, I think is important is that every school I go into, you know, it's one of those things the Americans talk about it being in favour of motherhood and apple pie. It's hard to argue against. Schools don't say we don't do differentiation here. They, they, you just don't do it. <laughs> so we differentiate the teaching and learning for the kids. We make our PGC students do it. I bet in your school requirements you talk about differentiation. But then why doesn't it apply to subjects. Why do we differentiate for kids, but then we don't differentiate when it comes to subjects? We wouldn't dream of saying, I treat all the kids identically and I just ignore any differences between them and I just do the same thing for all of them. Because that's sometimes what teachers are being asked to do. So if the maths teachers aren't being asked to provide a national curriculum sub-level every week, why should the music teacher? And in some of the schools that I visit, as, as Ali was saying, they have one music lesson a fortnight and they're on a rotation. They only do music for a term and then they go off and do art or drama or something. And so the actual time between them can be enormous. There's a difference between consistency and coherence. And I think we really do need to talk about that quite a bit more. So the questions are, does consistency mean doing that? And, and all these, why do schools recommend it? I think there's some quite, quite worrying things there. So... I've tried to talk about one of the things I think music teachers all should do is reclaim assessment. 
And one of the things we've, we've tried to do this evening with you is to, is to get you to think about assessment in music being musical. And I think there's an important point in that. I'm sure back in your own QTS days you read someone that's teaching music musically. Well, I think if we take out teaching <coughs> assessing, we want to be assessing music musically. And I'm quite happy that assessment in math should be mathematical, it should be geographical in geography and all the other words. That's fine. But I think in music, assessment should be musical. And I think that that's the word for me. It can be coherent. It doesn't need to be consistent. And so I think that's where the differentiation comes in. I do see a point in coherent assessment from a school's perspective. But that doesn't mean everything being done exactly the same way. And clearly, in music, maybe in PE as well, they're not going to want the kids. I, I don't know. I don't watch PE lessons very often, but I tend not to see kids taking exercise books out onto the field in order to write down what they've done. Clearly what I know about sport is minimal, but <laughs> my understanding of football teams is that they don't spend a lot of time writing essays about the football match that they've just played. Um, and that's how it's assessed. I, I, I do think that we, we need to think about that, this idea of coherence and consistency. So here's a question. How can assessments measuring attainment be used to demonstrate progress? And I'll unpick some of these with you. These are questions I want to leave floating. Are separate measures needed? There's another floating question. I'm leaving you a couple of floaters this evening. Are overarching curriculum goals the starting point for progression measurement? Earlier on we talked to you about what do you value in the music curriculum? And I think a sub, there's lots of sub-questions to do with that in terms of if you value it, is that what you want to progress? These are the things that you've talked about and how does that happen? So I just want to spend um, a little bit of time just thinking about some words and what they mean because um, clearly as an academic this is this sort of thing that can trouble me. So I've, I've divided these words into three sets and I think all the words in all the sets have something to do with each other but I worry about them in terms of being used as direct synonyms for each other. So, are assessment and evaluation the same thing? And whatever they are, are they the same as measurement? Now, I think I know what measurement is, but is it the same as assessment? And if that's the case, what's grading got to do with it? Now, all those words together, I think, do have something to do with each other, but I think they might mean something subtly different. Now, if we're talking about them, are we talking the same language to each other? Is your assessment my measurement? Is my measurement your assessment? Do you see what I mean? Because there's some real issues to do with that in terms of what's going on. There's an old country saying about you can weigh the pig every day. You've actually got to feed it in between to make it fatter. So I think in assessment terms, we do weigh the pig, but what are we doing to feed it? And is weighing the pig a measurement? Is it an assessment? Is it an evaluation? And if you start to think about pigs and what they weigh, you can see how they might be different. Let's go to set three next. Now, I do think progress and progression are linked, which is helpful because they're nearly the same word. But I think sometimes we use those in different ways. Ofsted have a very specific meaning, and it's to do with speed of progress, and that's to do with the speed of attainment, which is in a set two word. Are progression and development the same thing? There's difficult questions. And do they mean, what do they mean? And so that takes us finally to set two, because when Ofsted use these words, they're very careful. And they have specific meanings for attainment and achievement. But I wonder sometimes if we bundle all these together. And I, I think one of the things that would help us is if we can unpick in our own minds what all of these words mean and we become quite clear about it. This is made very obvious to me because part of what I do as an academic is, is write things and international collaboration is the flavour of the year and I'm writing things with American academics and in America these words don't mean what I mean them to be. So when I'm, having, when I'm writing a chapter with an American it takes weeks, sometimes months to work out that the words that we're using do not mean the same thing. And I came really a cropper in terms of measurement 
because I worry about what there is that we can actually measure, which I see as being different from assess, and they had no problem with that at all. I went to Chile earlier this year, this sounds like a punishment, I was invited by the Chilean government um, to go and talk about assessment to them, and I can't speak Spanish at all, and it was really interesting because they don't have a word for evaluation, it's the same word for assessment and evaluation. So this really messed up my PowerPoints <laughs> that talk about the difference between the concepts of assessment and evaluation. Those slides had to go because they've only got one word, evaluar. So it's really interesting. The con so if the word isn't there, is the concept missing? There's an Orwellian bit of thinking for you to uh, take away in terms of what's going on. But they're interesting. Now, again, I, 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 I keep banging on about being old at the moment. There must be something to do with it being winter, I think. Perhaps I'll feel fresher in the spring. Um, in ye olden days, we used to talk about AR and R, and AR and R was assessment, recording, and reporting, and they were different phases of the cycle. And we used to talk about AR and R quite a lot, and we don't anymore. And I think that's a problem in an Orwellian way because when I talk about assessment, what often happens is the teachers jump immediately to reporting, and they miss out the conceptualisation of the assessment that leads to the reporting. In the ye olden days, when we had A&R, R, A, R and R, it was straightforward because we talked about them separately. I think that by, by just bundling it all together, reporting isn't assessment. Reporting is the outworking of an assessment that has been recorded and then reported. But I think sometimes we jump straight to reporting and miss out the A and the R to get there. And, and that's a problem. And so because it's such a problem, um, I've drawn a picture like I do because that's how I think. Um, and so this is the first outing for this particular picture, so we'll see how it goes. Um, you've been working on your programmes of study, or whatever you call them. And so I think, um, as Ali was talking about earlier, that formative assessment we've I've put up at the top, and there's formative assessment taking place all along. Um, if you've come across things I've talked about or written before, I, I think music teachers have traditionally been really good at formative assessment. Then I think teachers from other subjects came along and told us we were doing it wrong and messed it up completely. But I think we were doing it. And again, it goes back to Matt's last day. But there's one of the things that I think became a problem is that other subjects didn't really understand it. And so I've used this very academic and very, very pedantic terminology, the formative use of summative assessment. Because that's how I see a lot of formative assessment being understood by schools now. What that, means, <laughs> what that means is that this is when you give a kid a grade and then talk about what they need to do to improve upon that grade. That's the formative use of summative assessment. And in many schools I see, they mistake that for true formative assessment, which is like the guitar teacher, put your fingers here, don't let your face up. That's formative assessment. The summative assessment is you've just got a 4C or whatever it was I said, I wasn't listening to myself as I was talking. Next time I want you to get a 4B. That's the formative use of summative assessment. So, Ali talked about the assessment lesson, and one of the things that I think is interesting is we do exactly this on our university course, so we don't walk the talk, and I've been trying for ages to do it. We give the students an assignment, and then we give them a cover sheet that tells them how they could do that assignment better were they to do it again. Of course, they've just handed the assignment in. They're not going to do it again. So us giving them feedback on how they could do it better next time is by and large irrelevant to them, so they're not going to do it again. So my point would be, and again my digital point, I won't extend that, why don't we give them a bit of summative assessment up there, used formatively, say, next time you do this, do this and you'll do it better. That's the formative use of summative assessment. That's why there's a green bit and a red bit. All the time formative assessment is going on. And then I talked about assessment, recording and reporting. How do you record your formative assessment? What do you do with your verbal feedback stamp given? How do you record that? And how does that find itself working in recording? So that's the point of that particular slide. Which takes us to what can be done about it? I appreciate we're now hitting the home straight, you'll be pleased to hear. Mm. So I don't want to go into great detail about criterion referencing. Um, if you're not sure what criterion referencing is, it, it's, that can be a little bit of homework. But, um, it's specifically to do with writing criteria for the musical task project activity being undertaken, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And one of the things that both Ali and I have spent a lot of time is to think about criteria for each task or project being undertaken being different. You need different criteria for them. 
And this is when our PTC students have trouble mangling the national curriculum levels. So that this week I'm using the national curriculum levels to measure a piece of samba, and next week I'm using the same national curriculum level to measure an entirely free composition based on a picture I've shown them. And it's the same wording, and that's where it becomes a problem. So if they've got different criteria for it, it does become a bit more straightforward. And then the assessment geek in me just wants to put criteria need to be uniquely defined and have a scalable measure. In other words, you do need to be able to say how much of something exists if you're going to be assessing it um, and what those are. Which takes us to... I think I'll let you talk about this. Yeah. Um, well, it links also to the units of work, which you've just been looking at, actually. Um, the, the slide before, if we go back to this one. Because we were getting you to look through those and think about, within your unit of work, what is it that progress? And so the criterion referencing in that actually ties directly to that. Um, we put together, it's in your packs, there's a nice pleasing wall chart, um, which the ISM supported us to put together. So if you don't let me, you can't read that at all. Yeah, we, um, we've been thinking about how, how do you show beyond levels, basically, um, <laughs> what might happen. So you'll notice it says at the bottom example statements A, example statements B, and the idea of this is that you shouldn't be able to just follow it straight across. We were quite purposeful about that. But basically, the, the bottom half of this model has got some, some different examples of what people might be able to do holistically over a longer period of time, um, which is entirely different to the units of work which you're just looking at, which have got kind of the more the fine detail in, if you like. So we've labelled them A, B, C and D, labelled them whatever you like. In fact, um, in Brighton and Hove, where I come from, we've just put um, together a secondary framework of, of kind of holistic ideas. It also incorporates things about values, which is quite an interesting idea. We haven't worked out if it's going to work or not yet. We came up with it over a bottle of wine last week, so it's early days on that. But basically, the idea of that is that it's got some other stages that kind of develop from that too. But you might just think, hmm, they look like levels. The idea of these, and I've written it and we've written it through the booklet as well, is that these are used holistically. So these are kind of the bigger picture stuff. And um, the bit at the top is saying, what is the musical activity that you are seeking? Basically, what we're trying to do um, is to get you to think about what is the learning that you're after and how are you going to get people to it? Rather than, I've got a nice set of activities. Oh, what did they learn out of that? Sometimes it, you know, it can be based, you know you've got to do something on, I don't know, for example, folk music or, or whatever, but it's to kind of start to get you to think about what is the learning that you're actually trying to seek and what is it that's going to progress through that rather than just being driven by the activities. So we've split some of the things down at the top, the singing, playing, improvising, composing and listening. And then thinking about well, what are the skills, what's the knowledge, what's the understanding. And then the, the right hand side of this is the assessment criteria, so what is it that you're actually using as uh, Martin was just saying. Um, and then how, it, how are you seeing that? And it's got there through improvising, through children making and creating music. So a lot of what you're, you're picking up um, is from this teacher radar idea, walking around the room, you're seeing stuff going on, you're talking to kids, you're interacting with them in that way. Um, not giving them a test, you know, not necessarily having assessment lessons, but just kind of gathering all of this information together. So that's really what the framework is, is for. Um, we have got really just an overarching framework um, idea and the idea is that you go away and you populate it yourselves because your kids might have 15 hours in a year and you might only have music for two years kids in other schools come in with a great musical experience they're already perhaps um, more musically experienced than they would be from other schools they get 90 hours of music across key stage three or they get maybe even 180 hours so you know you you have to decide what it is that you want from key stage three music it links also to what is the purpose of Key Stage 3 music, just kind of digressing slightly because we were talking about that over here. Um, what is it that you are trying to get from your Key Stage 3? If 90, about 92, 93% of children don't take music at the end of Key Stage 3, then what is the purpose of Key Stage 3? That's something for you to think about that links back to perhaps the values that we started with at the beginning. And if you design your Key Stage 3 so that it's just a, a kind of springboard into Key Stage 4 GCSE, what about kids who might want to do BTEC or Rock School or all of the other NCFE, all the stuff that's available? So kind of linking all these things together, the idea of this is that you would populate it yourself, but you would need to think through what are the values 
that you're trying to get through Key Stage 3 and what is it that Key Stage 3 music is about? Do you want to talk about that one? Wrong one, computer? We can talk about this one? Yeah. Um, one of the things we thought about <laughs> is, is to think about, when I said about a scalable measure, it is to, that we're suggesting a three levels of attainment and it hasn't quite transposed on the map of that, it should be a minus in front of that first slash. Sorry about that. I don't know why minuses don't work on a PC. Um, so we should say minus equals or plus. So it's three levels of graded attainment. Um, now in the, again, in ye olden days of national curriculum, we talked about working towards, working out and working beyond. You can have, can achieve with some help, can achieve, can achieve well, any, you can put your own language in. But the idea is that whatever phrase it is that you come up with, whatever the assessment criteria, you can assess it at three levels. So it's not three different criteria, because one of the things I see a lot in schools is they have assessment criteria that I think work on the process of accretion. It's like the snail shell. So to start with, they can do this, then they can do this and this, then they can do this and this, then they can do this, this and this, and with knobs on, then it's this, this and this with knobs on, and it turns green. And so every, it goes like this all the way through. Whereas I think it's more useful if we can have a single criterion statement that the kids either can't do yet, or whatever phrase you want, they can do it or they can do it really well. Now some schools, I've talked about this, well we've both talked about this, and they've said that's fine but we want five scales, you can have five scales if you well, like. Well today said nine, Did the they? email I showed you. Oh yes. It nine. Okay, you can have nine if you like, but I start head scratching yeah, at a certain point. Um, if you've got three, I think that's good enough to be going on with. <laughs> um, and that, you can have that for your, for your grading criteria. Now this is a real one, I've stolen from a school. Um, Pupil composed piece demonstrates effective use of dynamics. Now, the, the bit I, th I, I wanted to say to the teacher, well, that depends what you mean by effective use of dynamics. And the teacher said, I knew you were going to say that, Martin. I absolutely knew you were going to say that, and it doesn't matter. Because I know what I mean, and the kids know what I mean, and we don't have to talk about it. Whereas it's only you academics go, well, that depends what you mean by effective use of dynamics. So, but we get it. Come and watch. Come and watch 9Z doing it. And the kids are going, yeah, that had effective use of dynamics. And they didn't have to explain it. So it's only us academics that were tying ourselves in knots, saying it depends what you mean by effective. The kids got it. And I thought that, that was quite a salutary lesson for me, to actually watch that happening in the class, because it worked. And it avoided the, that's a 5A, I'll raise you a 6B, sold, that sort of option, because they were able to talk about it quite nicely. Our art colleagues, I've noticed, tend not to have this worry. That it just, it just flows. I think it's us musicians that for some reason we, we're desperate to try and do it. Now, I can't, can't give you a reason why. One of the ways that this, this can be worked, um, another one, effective use of an ostinato generator. This is another one I've stolen from a school. These are real ones, and all the teacher does is they have a series of these for each project. They have a series, and these are for the kids, and they just put a tick in the box. So they wander around and do it as the work is going on, and if it moves during the course of the work, they can put more or less ticks in. They get a view towards the end as to what's going on. Um, Sorry, is that the teacher or the student doing that? Together? I've seen both. So there's examples of, of people doing both. And we'll, you talk about that in a minute, won't we? There's yeah. some examples of, of, of kids doing this. But interestingly, the, one of the points is that it generates discussion with the kids, but it also it makes it manageable. I don't want to talk for hours on it. If you're interested in this, have a look at my blog where I've talked about it, and, and, and Ali's got some examples too. Um, because where it's heading is the idea of charts, and I just want to, to sort of track through how, how I got to this, because a lot of people have been working on charts in terms of doing this. Now, way back in the day, learning styles are now well discredited. Aren't they? We're not allowed to do learning styles anymore. I don't know if the school is, but a university. That's it. Learning styles are gone. Don't use them. Don't even talk about them. Don't even think about learning styles. So they're out. But we had this thing called the Cold Experiential Learning Group. And we used to track things on it that looked like that. Then when I, I started teaching, I'm almost reluctant to say this, um, so long ago that I used to steal circular graph paper from the maths department <laughs> and do it because compute, the, the maths department had a computer in my first school. It took up a room about the size of this and it did what a pocket calculator can do now. But I used to steal these and then do them. Musical Bridges did some, that's not a very good picture, sorry, but they did some as well. Brian, you've been working on radar charts too, haven't you? So there's a lot of people doing this. So this is basically what I was doing back in 19... Um, with those, but 
it, it's the come up. This is the earliest one I could find on my computer, of a computer generated one, that I put in when I was um, working about 10 years ago, in terms of the various ways <coughs> that you can chart it. Because what you can then do is you can pick out an aspect, and here's one that's filled in, and you get something like that, and the kids can do it, we'll talk about that in a minute, and here's progression, and progression is shown by the area under the graph increasing. So that's one way, and Excel will do this for you automatically. So it, you can use this as a way of, of talking about it. Um, the PGCE course at Sussex University, we've been using this for quite a few years now, where we get our trainees to think about um, what are the constructs of the teacher they think they want to be. We've also now been using it in school for quite a while. We've had a master's student whose school's now taken it up. And Anna is somewhere. Yeah. yeah. You've been using this now as well. Yeah, I've used it primary schools, but also <coughs> been adapted to secondary as well. So basically, you um, think of, well, I used your example, which is what, um, what things you would make a good singer. So um, I did an inset the other week at uh, school, and I said they wanted it to be about assessment. So I said, just give me the class, and I'll do it with them. And we, we were doing some singing stuff. And then we started thinking about what is it that is, is a great singer. And the idea is it's called the theory of personal construct because it's what they think that's important. And um, the idea of it, say, say for example you did about singing, they put around the outside what they think the constructs are of the great singer. My favourite of all time is say it, not spray it. Um, so the idea is it's very kind of, you know, kiddie focused. But then they have to decide for themselves on the scale of 1 to 10, 1 being in the middle and 10 on the outside, they're aiming towards 10. Where do they sit? And that's always really interesting because they're always very definite. I don't know if you found that with them. I'm a four. Yes. And then, you know, okay, you went to a conversation. Well, okay, what do you need to do? What's a five look like then? And why have you put yourself as a four? And it's quite interesting because you can also see children who are extremely underconfident. The London Youth Folk Ensemble have built their whole program based around what the uh, members of the ensemble think about themselves as ensemble folk musicians. So it's a, it's a great way to kind of chart things over time. But more than that, it's a fantastic way into conversation, which is what I'm really interested in kind of um, developing. If I want to get to know somebody and I want to get to know the kids, then even getting them to talk to each other and just listening in, getting them to explain it to each other. So that's where this comes from. Um, and I've written out an instruction list for you, which is inside your packs of all the different stages and given you a blank one. But you can just make the graph paper online. You don't have to draw it in space, Martin. Oh, I'll nick it from the master plan. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay, um, I just want to, I'll share this quick recording with you. We talked at the beginning about the idea of holistic um, assessment, and there's a really oh, good reason. A tech moment. Yeah, it's a tech moment, it might work. I'll come and find it. There's a reason that's really important. There's many reasons that's really important, but I thought of it as the cake. So the whole musical life is the whole cake, and the, the key Keep stage three cake. slice was the one that's just being eaten at the minute. But actually, the whole musical life is going on around that. We um, have a joint practice development day in Brighton and Hove, and the teachers run it themselves, and we get people in from outside too. A couple of years ago, one of them gave a child a video camera and said, go make a video of your musical life. So he wandered around for the whole week in the folk, folk band and going to the trumpet lessons and all of that stuff, and a little bit in the um, Key Stage 3 music lesson, stuff at home, doing his homework, playing on the iPad, digital technology, whatever, whatever. Oh, sorry. That's okay. And um, at the end of the week, the, the teacher came back, he came back to the teacher, gave him the video, and he said, oh, what's this got to do with music in school, this musical life? And he went, oh, I haven't got a clue. So basically, one of the things we need to do is try to get children to recognise for themselves and connect. Sorry. That's okay. So moving on to this then. This song, um, I collected it in a school, with permission, from a young lady called Tilly. And I was in the school, and the, the teacher said, oh, Tilly's finished her theory. Um, she writes really nice songs, why don't you go and listen to one? So we scuttled off into the, uh, the cupboard where the guitars were kept. And then she just played this song to me, and we'll just play you the very beginning bit, or the, a little bit of it. And she was in year nine. Waiting for love. This is a song she'd written herself in her free time. 
He's got a really lovely voice, he's got lots of guitar stuff going on. And so we got to the end of it and I said to her, oh that's great, are you studying music in school next year? And she went, no I'm not good enough, I'm a 5B. And so the way that we label the children in your, your classes says something to them about how they value themselves as a musician. And I, I think that's really, really important to go away with. The idea of musical assessment being a holistic view. How can you bring in the musical identity? If you're going to slap a label on somebody, it's got to be fair. And it's got to be able to incorporate that other stuff. So I suppose that's um, you know, really what I wanted to do with that, that video, uh, that um, sound clip. Over to you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to try and wind up um, as rapidly as possible and leave you with some big questions. Um, and these are here. And we've started to tease these out with you this evening. Do you know what you value in music education? If you don't value it, do you not teach it? What happens if your kids value it and you don't? What's the purpose of music in Key Stage 3 at your school? And then, as I say, take the how out. Does it link with what came before and the multiple options after Key Stage 3? Have you worked out your priorities for music education in the time available? If you've got 15 hours a year, if you work out what's important, because you can only get them into 15 hours, is that coherent word again? Is your curriculum coherent? I've written elsewhere, is it a cook's tour, culture, style, genres, traditions, and the great composers. I've seen curriculums, I don't wish to be rude, if this is your curriculum, you could have a good reason for it, but that it goes samba, and we get the tune percussion out, and we play a piece with the tune percussion, and we compose one, and then we record it, then next time it's gamelan, and we get the same tune percussion out, and we play a piece, and then we record it, then the week after it's minimalism, and you can see where this is going, and then it's the Viennese waltz, and it's, the, it's a cook's tour, it's the same resources, it's the same activities, but we've moved to a different culture, continent, or century. Um, how does your curriculum in and of itself evidence progression? And that's the bit that we ask you to do with your schemes of work. How, what happens in those? Well, now think big. How does it happen in your whole curriculum? Do you start from planned learning and work back to the curriculum? Is curriculum planning undertaken holistically or atomistically? Let's whiz through now. Um, one of my master's students, who's a head of music, wrote this. This was his master's dissertation project. I don't know what you think about that. Here's what he thought. Took him 20,000 words in 12 months to get there. <laughs> I think that's quite interesting, isn't it? Is that what you think as well? Which do you do? Not saying either of those is right or wrong. Which do you do? More takeaway questions. So, this is the point that we've been talking about throughout. Assessment arises from planning. Does the planning impose a ceiling on the learning? What happens if the kids can't progress because that's all you've planned for? Is the progression delineated in the planning? And is assessment specific to the task in hand? And validity. I said we'd have a reclaiming assessment too. Assessment for musical learning in and with through musical entertainment. It needs to be owned by the music department and the pupils. Think about progress and think about learning programmes and we'd like to finish where we started because we've done some blue sky thinking with you. And hopefully you've got some stuff to take away. So, um, sharing the units of work, I think perhaps the most interesting question for me out of all of this is if you didn't have to report back what you're doing, what would you do differently in music? I mean, the thing about CPDs is about, we want you to come along and listen to stuff, to try stuff, to think differently, to behave differently. If, if that what's holding your curriculum development back because assessment is often related to well it is integral to the curriculum development so if that you know that structure that you have to report something back every half term wasn't there or there's another way around it what is it that actually you want to do how is it that you want to move your curriculum on how is it you're going to move your assessment on and i suppose we wanted to we said to you about 10 minutes ago hold your thoughts on your your unit of work because ideally um there's some things that you've picked up tonight you think, actually, I could move my unit of work, I could move my teaching, I could move the assessment. So the, we asked you to hold those thoughts because, basically, now is the time to kind of go away with that unit of work and think, OK, how do I make this better for the kids? How does it reflect my values and how does it show the musical progression? How is it suitable for everybody in the class? You know, taking away some of the, the structural things that are there. I think people are getting very hung up on 
levels and sub-levels, and Martin and I are extremely keen to kick the conversation on from there. So these are some questions which we'll put up on the forum for you, but we're very happy to discuss online too. I don't want to delay people beyond that. Please. Okay, fine. Um, I, I, I'm totally in favour of uh, the holistic approach that we were talking about, especially in relation to assessment and position in general, and obviously the question about um, like what's it for, if it's considering that not, like a very, only a very small proportion of students actually take the use of key stage four. However, bearing in mind that that key stage four if they're following traditional reach GCSE, the, the way that they are assessed there, and I'm ignoring, ignoring BTEC at this stage, but if you think about how they're assessed at key stage form, which is in a very kind of, I don't know, much more old-fashioned way, do you think that there is an aspect that they have to be therefore prepared for that as well through key stage three? So, for example, the way that they have to be able to, you know, listen to piece of music and then write what the melody of this was such and such, the, the rhythm, don't you do that anyway through discussion in Q3? Through discussion, but not necessarily in that same kind of so, rigid framework. Okay, but do you need to do it in Q3 in that same kind of rigid framework? Because actually, you've, you've still got five more terms. The, what you're trying to get is a musical knowledge, skill and understanding, and the critical engagement, thinking as a musician, acting as a musician, or acting musically together through Q3. And if you do that successfully and kind of broadly, then I would argue probably that you're developing that skill set to be able to go on and successfully. <coughs> the, the best schools I work with are very, very successful. I don't know, Keith, what you think. I, I, I just, I talked about this at the weekend, um, and I found this quite salutary when I did this. Um, this was for a different presentation, sorry, but I said, 100 pupils get on your music train in year seven, that's what happens at the end of year nine. So the question that I would then, and that it gets even worse when you get for A-level, so my question would be, should the curriculum for these pupils be actually designed to only be a benefit to these guys? Because what does that say about those, if that's the case? So I, I, just, want, I just want to throw that out there. No, and I, absolutely, that I absolutely agree yeah. with that. I absolutely agree. Can, sorry, can I just say one other thing? Yeah. A, a thing that a lot of people are contacting me at the moment is to say that we've dropped national curriculum levels, we're using GCSE grades from year yeah. seven onwards. Yeah. And there's a little bit of me that does it back that and goes, because I mean, some kids are going to be G minus for an awfully long time before they get anywhere. So that's keep busy laughing. Sorry. Before they get thrown out. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, but are you? Because my question then is: We are you using national? Uh, are you using GCSE rating scale, or are you using GCSE criteria? Because they're very different things. Um, anyway, sorry. That, I, I interrupted. Another your, point that relates to that, though, is that um, the way that. That children, you, you get one chance to kind of blow it for somebody to feel unmusical forever. Lots Stephanie Pitt's work talks about this. You know, how key stage three music people are recovering from it still right through their adulthood. <laughs> and so, actually, at the values at the beginning, everybody was talking about enjoyment, engaging, engaging and inclusion and all of that kind of stuff. And so some, somewhere that has to be kind of embedded in what you do in, in key stage three. So, and it is... It's quite a big debate, really. You know, what's the key stage? Oh, yeah, what's absolutely. It what's it for? Uh, it's a good question. Can I just make a plug, particularly those people who have not engaged with the forum yet, who are registered with them teaching music? So there's actually quite a bit about that from last week's week before Inspire event as well. And in fact, I've got a rant up there, and, you know, I'm quite happy for anybody to sort of take pot shots at it, you know, because, I mean, that's the purpose of the exercise. I mean, Zoe was just saying that the last Inspire event two weeks ago was about the relationship. Field questions, I can just see a vague outline okay. of somebody doing <laughs> somebody something. Somebody, lovely. Okay, I think, was yours first and then I've got time for two. Um, so, I just had a question about um, the, the motivation of assessment. And um, I find that in schools, the culture of assessment and achievement in that sense is quite invaded in the children. Mm -hmm. And if you then have chain, if you say music is a subject where that system doesn't exist, does that create a hierarchy in which? music is perhaps to be taken less seriously as something to kind of really work hard at 
Um, and, you know, <coughs> I don't know if anyone else is, is, is in this situation, but, you know, do we find that assessment can be more, you know, the idea of um, assessing people and using something like that is in some respects um, motivational um, in order to put it on a level playing field with other subjects. For some, um, for some children, it, motivation is by knowing that they're a 6A and somebody else is a 5C. There's, there's, that's one kind of side of motivation. But um, the thing about Key Stage 3 music and the schools is that it's the schools that are embedding that culture of I'm this level, I'm that level, and being level hungry, if you see what I mean. So they don't come in from primary school with that, but I totally get that secondary schools have built that culture. So I suppose the first thing is safety in numbers. The only people who can make a change here is the foot soldiers, yourselves, basically. You know, what is it that you can do, talking to the art teacher, the, the drama teacher, there's a school in Bristol that um, has kind of ditched the levels thing, but they've, they've done something en masse with other schools doing things, um, with other teachers in the school. So I suppose from, from that point of view, um, there's a, you know, it, it swings both ways, doesn't it, if you know what I mean? So for some kids it's going to be motivating, for, for others more likely it's, it's not. If you want to make a change, you're the guys that can hopefully start to do that. Yeah. There's an interesting article from 1999, sorry I'm fishing, just not <laughs> mine. and it's called this, I'll be a nothing, structure agency in the construction of identity through assessment, it's about a little girl in this situation, who will knows in advance that she won't score the minimum level required for this assessment, and when the researcher says to her, what will you do, she says, I'll be a nothing, and so her view of her attainment is she knows in advance she is a nothing. So one of the things that I think worries me a little is if we construct things which automatically mean that some people fail them before we've begun. And so one of the things I've, I've spent a long time talking to our American colleagues is about is they talk about the motivation of assessment, but I also think there's a demotivation of assessment for kids who continually fail at them. And so while some kids are really keen to collect high grades and levels, there are equally some kids who know they will go from music to art to drama to geography to physics and they will fail in all those subjects one after another. And so there's a little bit of me that thinks, you know, I, I do worry about um, the, it's the consequences of assessment. I've got a master's student who's um, looking at moving assessment on and she's um, thinking about dialogic feedback and the power of talk. And she wanted originally to do this with a class in year seven, a class in year eight, and a class in year nine, but she quickly realised that it's too ingrained in her year nine class, and to a big extent in her year eight class. So instead, they've ditched it for year, um, they've ditched the levels and um, the discussion around it for year seven, for one year, and they're trying to see whether that makes a difference, basically, and looking at it in other ways. But it's very, very hard to change it when it's already going through. So sometimes these changes, one way to do it is to start at the bottom with a year seven class and try and change the culture for them because they haven't had that already. So that's a kind of strategic way into it, I suppose. There isn't an easy answer to any of this stuff. You know, I think people accept that there's changes to be made, but actually how you do that, sometimes it's down to you to go find other people. Sometimes it's, it's you know, taking Robin's article in and badgering the people higher up who are saying, this is the way we're going to do things. And I think also taking along to them another model and saying, this is been successful somewhere else because it's all very well to say okay I don't want to use levels and sub-levels so the deputy head turns around and says so what are you going to use instead like actually I haven't got a clue so you need to think that stage out as well about what you might want to do. Do you have any stuff that you can post on there like yeah, those example schools um, and what they're doing? Early days but we're kind of hoping that you're going to help us with that too that was another thing. Yeah we've got a couple of teachers we have been working with but it's all to do with data protection and stuff. So if we could use the closed VLA. Yeah, if people yeah. are willing to share things. Just to add, because hopefully you are involved in teaching music, and um, obviously what we're going to be asking you to do uh, at the beginning of the day is to choose something that you've come across in uh, teaching music. It could be something that's come up tonight, and look at putting that in place in your classroom, making a change, seeing what the impact is. So you could choose something around assessment. It will be supported by your fellow, so you'll have someone to have a dialogue with. Lots of fellows too.
guys could do it. Um, I think from what Ali said, it is, we're at a point where we need to move things on. It's needed. One of the great ways of doing that is to try something out and share your learning. Um, so please do think about whether you want to be that new city. And we're really willing to support you to do that. I think that the, the answer to the, your question is, um, there's a lot of work to be done, but it has to start somewhere. And if you're willing to help out to try things, whatever, to share that with us, you know, and try and develop it, then that would be great. I think you had a question. <coughs> yeah, I'll make it really brief because I know we're sort of one thing. But um, it, I, you've actually just touched on this and what you just said in answer to that question. But my um, my school is now that Levin's going out the window, becoming a bit obsessed with developing a system of assessment where there is no way of students being compared to each other to get rid of that whole idea of I'm, I'm nothing, I'm a, I'm a three and I should be a seven. Mm -hmm. So therefore they're trying to develop something where it's all about kind of having some sort of overarching baseline, which obviously is a nightmare because they're trying to do that for every subject in one test, but there we go. Um, and then, <laughs> then constantly being so then assessed wrong. against their own band and right. all this sort of thing. So then when I'm trying to say things like, hey, look what the ISM is saying, what criteria are you say they've met it or they haven't met it? And then I'm being told, no, you can't say they've met it because they have to have met it for them. And which all sounds ridiculous and very complicated. But I was just gonna really ask whether this was either like this idea of kind of um, students being comparable was a, was something you felt was an issue, which you kind of said about already, but also I just in your experience are other schools doing this because I just I find the whole thing slightly over thought. <laughs> and I don't know, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe if you simple. if you sit children on a red table, a green table or a blue table at Five years old they start comparing themselves to each other so even if you're hiding some of that structural stuff actually they're not going to see through some of that um, no. but I mean getting them to compare themselves to themselves is great you know Absolutely. what development have I made is a really nice aspiration in that in that sense it's, you're the only person I've heard of that's doing I think what I would characterize as being multiple simultaneous ipsative assessment <laughs> and so if that's the case, that would be a really fascinating yeah, case study. very much. So uh, you've got the gig. <laughs> <laughs>